Sing praise, sing praise, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever and ever, forever. The parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12 verses 13 to 21 shows us a man who did not understand what life was about, that it consisted not in wealth but in relationships. Lucas Sudreth is a graduate student at HCU and he is the administrative assistant in the Office of Enrollment Services. In this lesson, he admonishes us to live generously so that we can avoid the condemnation received by the rich fool. If you would, please turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We're going to be looking through verses 13 through 21. That's Luke 12, 13 through 21. And while you're turning there, I want to ask, how many of you love going out to eat? I can definitely say I do. You get to go to a restaurant, you get to sit down in a nice comfy chair, and you get to let people bring food to you. And while you're eating the food, you can make a mess, it doesn't matter, because someone's going to clean up for you afterwards. So I, like, I, I definitely love going out to eat. But some of us, when we go out to eat, we turn into a different animal altogether. We turn into what you may call food hoarders. We get our knife in one hand, we get our fork in the other, and as soon as that plate hits the table, we become very, uh, very different people. Very different. We say, these are my fries, and I need every last one of these fries, and if you want some, you better go ask the waiter, because these are my fries. We become food hoarders. And sometimes we can do this with our congregation. We become hoarders of our congregation, and we're fine with people coming to our congregation as long as they understand that this is my church. And as long as you don't get in my parking spot or sit in my seat, we will have no problems. I'll share it with you, but don't mess with it. Don't mess with my stuff. <laughs> when someone arrives, when someone comes and sits in our spot, you know what we do? We say, okay, I'll just come early next week. And I'm going to arrive an hour early and I'm going to take my spot back. Sometimes we can be food hoarders. However, you know, as members of the body of Christ, our purpose, our mission is to introduce people to Jesus Christ. Our purpose, our mission is to share Jesus Christ with other people. And it is also to help them follow him. First, we share and then we care for other people. We share the gospel with them and we care for them afterwards. And this is how we need to be. Our part in helping the body of Christ grow is by being generous, which is the title of our lesson today, our theme, is generosity. And it's in John 3.16 that it says that God so loved the world that he gave. He gave us his son. He gave him up to us. He was generous. However, our text is Luke 12, 13 through 21, and if you'll notice, that that's the text about the rich fool. You're thinking, Lucas, that, that doesn't make any sense. We're here, we're, we're talking about generosity, and this man wasn't gen had no generosity within him whatsoever. However, he, he's a great example of what not to do. Sometimes the best thing you can do is study what not to do. One time there was a banker who was uh, training he was in training and he went to a conference and all they did that week was study and feel authentic $100 bills. And at the end of the week, they could tell the authentic bills from the inauthentic bills because they had handled it. They knew it. And so we're going to look at Luke 12 and we're going to see what not to do. Let's read verses 13 through 15. Let's read it together. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge? Who made me an arbitrator over you? 
And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Here in the previous verses, Jesus had been talking to the disciples and the crowd about remaining faithful even during times of persecution, times where great faith was required. He was talking to them about it, and I want you to imagine yourself sitting there in the crowd, and Jesus is standing there, the disciples are around him, and then outside is the crowd, and you're listening with rapt attention. You're listening to the words that are coming out of his mouth, and you just can't believe it. You've never heard these words before. You don't understand. You're, you can't believe that this is happening to you. You're hearing about salvation and how God, he loves you and he cares for you. And then a man stands up and he says, Jesus, Jesus, hey, over here, over here. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Give me more inheritance. And by this point, you're thinking, what is going on? Why is this man standing up interrupting Jesus who is, who is talking so eloquently, who's giving us the bread of life, the word of life? How could he do this? How could he stand up? But Jesus is a master orator, and he continues on with his theme of faithfulness. How he changes it slightly. Now he's including covetousness. He's remained faithful. Do not fall away into covetousness. And the reason why this man, uh, Jesus, reacts so harshly is because this man is asking Jesus to stop what he's doing. Stop proclaiming the gospel. Stop proclaiming salvation and instead focus on me and my problems. You know, and during this time, uh, many of us don't, may not realize it, but during this time it was very shameful to air out your family's dirty laundry, to go to someone else And ask for help because it proved that you couldn't do it yourself. You weren't man enough to handle it yourself. And that's exactly what this man is doing. He's trying to get other outsiders to come in and help him get more. That's what he's trying to get Jesus to do. And in verse 15, Jesus switches from addressing the man. He says, hey man, who made me an arbitrator? Who demoted me from savior to a judge? So he says that, and now he switches to the crowd. He switches to the apostles. And he says, watch out. Be on your guard for all covetousness. The motivation for this man's request is based in two things. It's based in greed, and it's based in long-term security. That is why this man is doing this. He's not doing it out of generosity. He's doing it out of greed. Jesus, Jesus warns the people. He says, be careful. Or you may end up just like this man, worried so much about your future, worried so much about your possessions that you're going to forget about your salvation. Moving on to verse 16, it says, And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample good laid up. For many years you have laid up. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Upon first glance, some of us may think that this is good business sense. It's a good idea to take your things and hide them, save them away for retirement. And yes, it is. It is a good idea to save for retirement. But is that really what Jesus is talking about here? Is he talking about retirement? No, that's not it at all. Jesus, his followers, more than 90% of them were very poor. They did not have much. They worked in the fields. They didn't own businesses. They didn't have large plots of land. They were very poor people. And so if you really look at it, you realize, no, that's, that's not what it's talking about at all. Jesus is not talking about being a good business owner and saving for retirement. The point that Jesus is trying to make is that this man's actions were completely self-centered. They were not generous. He was not thinking of others. He was thinking about himself. One commentator put it this way. He lives completely for himself. He talks to himself. He plans for himself. He even congratulates himself. 
Let's move on to verse 20. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Underlying all of this is the point that the farmer sought to secure his future without any reference to God talking about all the things he's going to do, all the things he has, and he doesn't mention God once. Thus God labels him a fool, meaning that uh, someone who uh, rebels against God or whose practices, their practices deny God. That is what a fool means, and he says, you are a fool. Your practices have denied me. He forgot that his life was on loan from God. He thought he had plenty of time left in this world. He was going to sit back and relax and retire. But all too soon, God said, no, I'm ready to take it back. We may think otherwise, but it's always God who has the last laugh. It's always God who has the last word. Because at the end of verse 20, God asked the landowner, all of these things you've prepared, all these things you've worked so hard for, whose will they be now? And we know this answer, it's rhetorical, but the answer is, well, they're not going to be his. This landowner will have these things no more. This man is what we might call a food hoarder. And I mean that in the most literal sense. When this man got French fries, they were his and they were his alone. He did not share any of it. However, now I want to switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about food sharers, the opposite end of the spectrum. My family, we went out to eat for uh, New Year's Eve. On New Year's Eve, we went to Carrabba's, and it was, it was very interesting to watch because my grandmother, she ordered some steak, so then I ordered some shrimp, and my mom ordered some pasta, and it was funny because everyone's order depended upon someone else's. Order. And in that way, we could each have a little bit of everything. And we just swapped food all night long. And we shared and we laughed together and we enjoyed our meal together. We, were, we are food sharers. And when it comes to the church, we want to be the kind of people who have the food sharing mentality. We want to have a generous attitude towards others. We want to be generous with what we have so that others might be able to experience experience God's grace, His mercy, and His love, just like we do every single day. Man, are we blessed. We're blessed to have such great experience, such great love from God. We want to be like the church in Acts chapter 2, where they sold everything they had and gave to one another as one had need. They had this unselfish generosity that flowed from the realization that you can never outgive God. Never outgive Him. You know, there was a man one time who asked his minister, he said, How much should I give when the collection plate comes by? And the minister says, Well, you need to give as much as Christ gave. And he was making a joke because Christ gave his all. He gave everything. He went destitute. He slept on the side of roads. He, uh, he, ha- he had nothing. He gave it all. And so that's what made it kind of funny. And we can never outgive God because he gave everything he had. We become food sharers. We become real Christians when we have these two things, when we do these two things. We become food sharers, real Christians, when we believe that what we have is worth sharing. Then we become true Christians, real food sharers. We're sharing the the food of life with one another. And it's when we believe that what we have is valuable. And that's something that we oftentimes uh, don't quite understand or don't quite realize is that the gospel is valuable. When you add all the numbers together, you realize that a very small percentage of the people in the world actually have the gospel and understand it as we do. Very few people realize that. And it's more precious than all of the the gold in the world, all of the precious gems, all of the precious metals in the world. The gospel is very valuable. 
We become real Christians when we believe that what we have is worth sharing. we got to value that. Secondly, we become food sharers, we become food Christians when we believe in the power of what we have. When we believe in the power of the gospel. It's in Matthew 16, verse 15, where it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In this passage, Jesus is talking to his disciples who they heard from Mary Magdalene that Jesus had risen and they said, no, no, he hasn't risen. And Jesus comes to them and he instructs them to go forth sharing the word of God, baptizing believers in his name. He instructs them to do these things and he elaborates on the power that they will be given, the power of belief, the power of the gospel by telling the disciples and the believers that they will be able to cast out demons. They will be bitten by snakes and not be hurt. They will be immune to poison. They will be able to heal the sick. And it's through their belief in the power of the gospel and the power of Christ that they were able to do these things. Belief is a powerful thing. And when we truly believe in the gospel, when we truly believe in the value, the value of the gospel, man, Wow, it can do great things. The gospel can touch lives. Many times we hold back from from spreading the gospel because we struggle with, we don't see the value and we don't see the power. And we say things like, well, I don't think the gospel will be able to reach this person. I don't think this person will be able to believe or understand or would be willing. And when we say things like that, when we put doubt in the gospel, We're hurting the gospel. We're we're hurting the cause of Christ when we have doubt. We don't think it has power. When we don't value it enough to share it with others, put a lot of doubt. We must believe that the gospel is worth sharing. We've got to. We must be generous. And this is how we're going to be generous Christians is having believing in the value and believing in the power of the gospel. As I said earlier, our purpose, our mission as members of the body of Christ is to two things. Our purpose, our mission is to introduce people to Christ, to share Christ with others, be generous with the gospel. Say, I want you to hear this. I want to share this with you because it means so much to me. It has so much value and I believe in the power of the gospel. This is why I want to share it with you. So we must introduce people to Jesus Christ. That is our mission. And secondly, we must help them follow him. We must care for one another. We must be like the church and be generous with our things. The first century church, they sold the things they had and said, I want to give this to you. I want to give it to you. We must be like that with the gospel. One of the saddest things I heard recently was uh, a man was selling a, a large piece of land and he sold it, and he bought himself a new car. And I was so upset. I was so upset because the church could do great things, great things with just a small portion of what he sold that land for, of what he could have given to God, what he could have given to the church. We could have done great things with that. So today, let's remember the value of the gospel and the power of the gospel. And in that way, we can be generous with the gospel. Thank you. Sing praise.